Welcome to the IISS hybrid session on Bangladesh's foreign policy priorities and challenges. My name is Rahul Roy Chaudhary. I'm the Senior Fellow for South Asia at the IISS in London. Today's session is a continuation of the IISS focus on Bangladesh in this very special year. The birth centenary of Bongo Bondhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman the late founder of Bangladesh and father of the nation. Our last session on Bangladesh that we held at the IISS took place in March with a webinar on India-Bangladesh relations with Dr. Gohar Rizvi, the international affairs advisor to the prime minister of Bangladesh and Pankaj Saran, India's deputy national security advisor. In these endeavors, we have been very pleased to cooperate with the dynamic Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, Saida Muna Tasneem, who's here with us today, whom I've had the privilege of knowing from her earlier stint in London. We are delighted today to welcome the, to the IISS Ambassador Masood bin Momin, the Foreign Secretary of the Government of Bangladesh. Earlier Ambassador Momin served as Bangladesh's Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Ambassador to Japan and Ambassador to Italy. He also served as the Director General of South Asia at the Foreign Ministry Headquarters in Dhaka. We look forward to listening to an authoritative Bangladeshi perspective on its foreign policy priorities, how the situation in Afghanistan impacts Bangladesh, relations with both India and China, and of course, climate change. Ambassador Momen has kindly agreed to provide introductory remarks for 12 to 15 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. For those of you in this room who would like to make a comment or ask a question, please raise your hand to get my attention. For those attending virtually, please use the chat function to type in your question or your comment, and I will then convey uh, this uh, to the Foreign Secretary for his response. Please note also that the session is on record and will be on our website within the next 24 hours. Sir, may I invite you to give your introductory remarks? Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on uh, where you are. Uh, I thank you for the kind uh, uh, invitation to me to share uh, some thoughts on Bangladesh's foreign policy priorities and challenges. Uh, I have come to London to attend the fourth strategic dialogue between Bangladesh and the UK, uh, which assumed uh, added significance for being the first one since the UK's uh, conclusive exit uh, from the European Union. We are pleased to have had the opportunity to hold this dialogue in person uh, following a prolonged intermission posed uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this year, Bangladesh has experienced uh, the confluence of three important milestones. We are celebrating the 50th uh, anniversary of Bangladesh's independence, the Golden Jubilee, the birth centenary of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and also the UN announcement for Bangladesh's eligibility to graduate uh, from the least developed country uh, category. The celebratory uh, spirit has prevailed despite the rude uh, shocks of the second wave of the pandemic and also enabled us to tide over the disruptions caused uh, by the uh, Delta variant in recent weeks. Under the astute uh, guidance of our Honorable Prime Minister, we have maintained a delicate balance between saving people's lives and livelihoods. And that perhaps explains our economic growth to the tune of 5.2% in uh, 2020, uh, despite uh, the global slump. Uh, prior to the pandemic, Bangladesh was well on its way to register 8% uh, GDP growth rate, being one of the fastest growing countries in the world. By this time, following a series of restrictive measures, we have opened up our economy, uh, decided to reopen schools in a couple of days, and resumed nationwide vaccination for the 18 plus population group. We have secured sufficient supply uh, for a sustained vaccination campaign, along with arrangements for fill and finish locally through collaboration with the Chinese uh, company Sinopharm. Our 
Honorable Prime Minister has called for considering uh, vaccines to be global public goods, and we advocate uh, for keeping the production and certification of safe and efficacious uh, vaccines above political uh, considerations. We are grateful to our friends in India, China, Japan, and the US for making us some gifts of vaccines. Even uh, Bulgaria has uh, you know, uh, given the latest uh, uh, supply of uh, some uh, 200,000 plus uh, uh, AstraZeneca vaccines. Uh, some of them gave uh, through the COVAX facility and others uh, directly. The pandemic has uh, certainly uh, exposed the fault lines in the global pandemic response and the inherent inequities in the procurement of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. For, many, uh, for any foreign policy practitioner at this time, the biggest priority and challenge at the moment is uh, to work towards collective actions to assess pandemic risks and put in place a robust preparedness mechanism uh, based on equity and flexible or adaptable uh, enough uh, to cope with uh, the subsequent waves, if any. We have also made efforts to reach out to our friends in other parts of the world with medicines and physicians, nurses to respond to their emergency appeals. The lessons learned from the so-called COVID-19 diplomacy would most likely remain valuable and relevant for us for the days to come. To move away from the COVID-19 in general terms, Bangladesh's foreign policy orientation was defined uh, by the infallible dictum of our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, that is, friendship to all, malice towards none. Our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has maintained that motto as the touchstone for her foreign policy conducts that has so far allowed Bangladesh to, pace, to pass the tests of time without compromising the underlying values and principles of our statehood and identity as a sovereign nation. It has now become a regular staple of regional foreign policy discourse as to how Bangladesh has navigated its way through challenging circumstances and still managed to remain friends with all key regional actors without falling into any particular orbit or influence or alliance. Our traditional attachment to non-alignment and our overriding focus on sustaining our inclusive economic growth have made the choices uh, to be made for us somewhat preordained. The continuation of our political leadership over a period of time and the relative political and social uh, stability have also allowed our foreign policy uh, conduct to be geared at sustaining our economic growth trajectory and poverty elevation efforts in a focused and coordinated manner. At this juncture, I would like to identify the five areas uh, of priorities and challenges that tend to preoccupy my agenda as Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh. First, Bangladesh finds itself in a rather restive regional context, with the recent developments in Myanmar and Afghanistan further aggravating the situation. With Myanmar, we have the outstanding issue of repatriation of more than a million uh, forcibly displaced uh, Myanmar nationals or Rohingya uh, in safety and dignity. The military coup in Myanmar has marked an abrupt halt in our regular communication with them, which makes the uh, Rohingya situation further precarious. In Afghanistan, we remain tuned to the dramatic developments and would hope to draw assurance of the Taliban leadership's commitment not to allow the Afghan territory to be used for posing or inciting terrorist threats to other countries. We have signaled our availability to work together with the UN and the EU to share our experience in development and humanitarian work in Afghanistan, as we have uh, done uh, through our NGOs in the last uh, two decades. With our larger neighbors, India and China, we are bound by strategic partnerships and remain committed to promoting a peaceful, secure, and inclusive vision for shared regional prosperity. Bangladesh has always remained a strong proponent of regional cooperation, and we continue to invest in sub-regional connectivity initiatives to further integrate the South Asian economies. Building on the motto of connectivity is productivity, we are working on making Bangladesh realize its potentials for becoming a regional hub. 
with the dynamic cohesive Southeast Asia on our border, we have made a submission to have closer engagement with them as a sectoral dialogue partner. Second, Bangladesh has emerged as an important provider of stability in the region, including by ensuring human security for the eighth largest population in the world. With the world's growing focus on now on the Indo-Pacific, Bangladesh's strategic significance is getting the attention of foreign policy pundits and diplomatic practitioners. In pursuance of our traditional pursuit of Pacific settlement of disputes, we have peacefully resolved land demarcation and maritime boundary delimitations uh, with India and Myanmar in a peaceful manner with recourse to international legal system. Bangladesh is now poised to reset its bilateral engagements with its major international partners, including the UK and the EU, to introduce strategic dimensions to our value-based partnerships. It is perhaps no coincidence that I was in Berlin last week for our first ever strategic dialogue and find myself here in London for the fourth round of our strategic dialogue. We are imparting the message to our international partners, especially those in the West, that Bangladesh is now looking for shifting our foreign policy focus from development cooperation to trade relations uh, and investment uh, promotion towards comprehensive strategic engagements. We believe that the economic growth and stability experienced by Bangladesh offer opportunities for our partners for the mutual benefits of our peoples. Bangladesh does have critical perspectives to share on climate change, migration, sustainable development, global supply chains, countering terrorism, cyber security, and many other issues of global and regional importance. Third, while we rejoice in our qualification to graduate from the LDC status, having achieved a medium range ranking in the UN's Human Development Index much earlier, we remain sensitized to the challenges that we would have to brace for during the lead up to the transition and beyond. The tectonic shifts in geoeconomics and the advent of the fourth industrial revolution do not allow us much space to rest on our laurels in a highly competitive environment. On one hand, we have the challenge of making our international partners appreciate and accommodate in both bilateral and multilateral contexts. Some of the structural challenges that will continue to characterize our development pathway. On the other hand, we are required to continuously work on the domestic front with all concerned stakeholders to address issues of concern over investment climate, market access barriers, labor and environmental standards, and intellectual property protection as flagged by our potential business partners from the West. We would continue to pursue an export-led economic growth momentum, and we wish to ensure that Bangladesh remain a responsible actor in the global value chain. We remain sensitized to the fact that Bangladesh has not concluded many free trade agreements with other countries and would have to seriously develop our intellectual and negotiating capacity within a short period of time to prepare for such undertakings. The momentous development with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP makes it incumbent upon Bangladesh to reflect on an evolving regional economic future that should not bypass it altogether. We need to work aggressively to make Bangladesh a destination of choice for international investments, including in our 100 special economic zones and 36 high-tech parks projected to come in the next 10 years. We feel encouraged to see the interested generate, interest generated in these facilities from our key development partners like Japan, China, and the Republic of Korea, among others. Fourth, our national security remains a prime element in our foreign policy concerns, especially in the backdrop of recent international focus on the Indo-Pacific. We have redeemed our Honorable Prime Minister's pledge not to allow our own territory to be used against the interest of our neighboring countries, be it for terrorism or other transnational crimes. We have maintained our sound record in combating financing of terrorism, have scored the highest among the South Asian nations in cybersecurity and scaled up our preventive actions against human trafficking and irregular migration. We remain sensitized to the security risks posed by climate change and remain focused on changing the narrative from vulnerability to sustainability and 
resilience, and ultimately prosperity. We have started making forays into nuclear power generation and peaceful use of outer space and remain committed to fulfill our international obligations for responsible conduct. Bangladesh's value-driven and front-ranking contributions to UN peacekeeping operations is a hallmark of peace diplomacy, which is also manifest in our engagements in peace building and flagship promotion of the women peace and security agenda. We also take pride in our legacy of steering the UN General Assembly resolution on a culture of peace for more than two decades now. On our national defense front, we are working together with our armed forces to further diversify our sourcing of strategic, operational, and tactical capabilities for our deterrence capabilities. Fifth, multilateralism has traditionally been a particular area of strength in our diplomacy. Over the last 45 years, we have made our footprints visible in the UN in diverse domains. While we also espoused the values and causes of the Commonwealth, OIC, and NAM, with the emerging dynamics within the multilateral context, we are part of a number of coalitions of the willing, ranging from issues of e-governance to preventing violent extremism to prevention of drowning. Bangladesh has traditionally been the spokesperson for the least developed countries and assumed co-chairship of the fifth UN LDC conference slated for January next year. We made proactive contributions to the formulation of the sustainable development goals, uh, drawing inspiration from our achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. We took lead in promoting safe, orderly, and regular migration, including through mooting the idea of a global compact that was subsequently adopted through extensive negotiations. In recent times, our Honorable Prime Minister lent her voice and support for the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on water and took over the joint stewardship of WHO's high-level forum on antimicrobial resistance. She has now assumed the lead of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, CVF, and looks forward to speaking for nearly 1 billion people from 48 countries under the remit of the forum. We remain active in all three key pillars of the UN's work, encompassing peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights. Last but not the least, we now attach priority to public diplomacy as a critical foreign policy tool to project the image of Bangladesh to the international community that is attuned to the ground reality of our democratic, pluralistic, inclusive, and multi-ethnic polity. We attach high importance to our cultural legacy and heritage and have made it to a point uh, to project our secular, progressive, and syncretic value system to the rest of the world. The prime example, our contribution is the declaration of 21 February as the International Mother Language Day to celebrate our historic attachment to the multilingualism and multilingual education. We are exploring ways to make enhanced use of social media tools for accelerating our twin objectives of pursuing economic diplomacy and public diplomacy. To conclude, I would say for sure that it is an exciting time to engage in shaping the direction and building blocks of Bangladesh's foreign policy. It is absolutely critical that our diplomats of the future are groomed properly to take on the unforeseen opportunities and challenges coming their way. We are making concrete time-bound plans to build the professional competence of our next generation diplomats that is likely to go through a massive transformation with the onset of artificial intelligence and other cutting edge factors. I shall take a pause here and uh, may take some questions. Thank you very much. Foreign Secretary, uh, thank you very much uh, for those authoritative remarks and the uh, five key priorities uh, that you've, uh, you've listed and discussed. Uh, let me start the discussion session by asking you a question on your first priority. Uh, and I think you, know, you mentioned this in the context of Bangladesh being uh, in a restive region where there is uh, Myanmar on one side and further along there is Afghanistan. Uh, today at the IISS, uh, we've had two uh, sessions focused on Afghanistan and concerns over uh, regional security and radicalization in the region. Uh, my question to you, sir, is, is this, uh, is that uh, to, could you tell us a bit about the impact that you think the, the uh, the uh, the conservative Taliban ideology emanating 
uh, or resounding from Afghanistan could have on Bangladesh, uh, especially uh, for two reasons. One, uh, Bangladesh is one of the top five Muslim countries in the world. And secondly, it's had a zero tolerance policy uh, towards uh, radicalization and extremism and uh, been one of the very few countries taking a tough line against organizations like the jamaat e mujahideen Bangladesh and, and others. So how does this, uh, how do the developments in Afghanistan affect concerns over radicalization in Bangladesh? Uh, thank you. Uh, very uh, hot topic these days. Uh, uh, of course, uh, we are observing uh, very closely and monitoring the fast uh, developing uh, uh, situation in Afghanistan. Uh, we had historically a very good relationship uh, with the Afghan people and that country uh, uh, during 1971. I remember uh, Afghanistan and their people were helpful uh, for Bangladesh and uh, uh, many Afghans helped uh, uh, Bengalis uh, coming out of uh, the then uh, West Pakistan uh, through uh, Afghanistan and then to uh, India and Bangladesh. Uh, and, uh, you know, subsequently also we, we had uh, a good relationship uh, with them uh, when uh, the security situation was not so bad. Uh, we had our embassy there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the last 40 years uh, were not uh, very conducive uh, for a country like Bangladesh to pursue uh, the regular, uh, you know, relationship uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, interestingly, uh, many of or some of our, uh, you know, world class NGOs, including BRAC, they had good footprint uh, over the years, uh, made good footprint, made good contribution in areas like uh, education, uh, healthcare, uh, <clears throat> and uh, other uh, public uh, uh, delivery uh, systems, uh, public service delivery systems. Uh, therefore, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, rather uh, unfortunate that uh, uh, suddenly, uh, you know, uh, these people had to be uprooted and many of our Bangladeshis uh, already returned to Bangladesh, but some are still remaining uh, by their own choice. Uh, therefore, uh, we see uh, the current developments as a, you know, uh, as a source of uh, concern. Uh, at the moment, uh, and uh, we have our own uh, fringe elements in our society. Uh, in the past, as you mentioned, there were some connection. Uh, some of our chaps, uh, I think, uh, did travel to Afghanistan uh, to uh, fight along uh, with uh, the Mujahideens in the first case, and then maybe stayed back and uh, you know uh, helped out the Taliban. But these numbers are not uh, big, and uh, uh, right now, uh, we have not uh, detected uh, any uh, concerted move uh, from these uh, groups. Uh, they are being uh, monitored and, uh, and our uh, agencies uh, uh, have uh, geared up uh, surveillance uh, uh, <clears throat> measures. Uh, obviously, uh, Bangladesh, uh, the core ethos in Bangladesh is, uh, you know, secular uh, credentials, uh, and uh, in fact, we fought our uh, war of independence uh, and one of the major uh, ideals uh, was to pursue uh, secularism. And uh, you mentioned Bangladesh is the fifth largest uh, Muslim country, uh, but our uh, brand of Islam is more tolerant brand. Uh, and, and that's why, uh, you know, uh, on socioeconomic index uh, or indices, uh, you'll see a uh, you know, very good advancement uh, for Bangladesh, whether it is uh, women's empowerment or girls' education or, or you know, mainstreaming uh, uh, women uh, in the national uh, development activities. Uh, therefore, uh, <clears throat> uh, we are observing at the moment uh, and uh, uh, currently uh, there is uh, no serious uh, uh, sort of indication uh, that uh, uh, it will become worse or anything like that. Uh, but obviously it would be up to the Afghan people uh, at the end of the day, uh, what kind of inclusive government they would like to see. And then uh, the pledges and the promises uh, made uh, by the Taliban this time around, we'll see how they are reflected in reality. And then uh, Bangladesh uh, stands ready uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, facilitate 
uh, whether it is through our NGOs or other institutions, uh, but also under the UN auspices or the EU, uh, if they take an initiative, we'll be very much uh, uh, hopefully be part of that. But definitely it is uh, our region and Afghanistan is a member of uh, SARC. Uh, so we, we believe that uh, for the regional uh, uh, prosperity, uh, the stability is required. And as a member of SARC, uh, if whatever contribution we can make, we'll be ready to do that. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. I uh, have a question which has come in uh, similar to the one I posed, uh, and I think you answered really even the second part, uh, which is uh, how should the international community respond to this geo geopolitical challenge? And I think you sort of mentioned this in your response uh, to the question. Just before I go to my colleague to ask him to introduce uh, himself, uh, I just want to let people who are uh, online uh, know that uh, they can uh, put in questions by typing uh, in the chat function. And I will then be able to present uh, the questions or the comments to the Foreign Secretary, uh, please. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, I'm Nick Crawford, a researcher on the Geoeconomics and Strategy Program at the IISS. I'd like to ask two questions, if I may, Your Excellency, about relations between Bangladesh and China. Firstly, Bangladesh seems to have managed its economic cooperation with China very carefully. Bangladesh participates in the Belt and Road Initiative, but appears to do so uh, on Bangladesh's own terms. Uh, it has sometimes preferred cooperation with multilateral development banks, with other bilateral partners over cooperation with China, although there have been some significant projects. How would you describe Bangladesh's approach to economic cooperation with China? And what might other countries learn from Bangladesh's approach? And the second question is, uh, on pressing issues in the region, perhaps specifically the crisis in Myanmar, uh, where China is an important player, uh, what talks has Bangladesh been able to have with China? And what scope is there for cooperation on these issues? Thank you uh, for your uh, questions. Uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, is, of course, uh, part of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, as, uh, idea mooted by China. Uh, but as you have uh, rightly uh, pointed out, uh, for us, uh, these are uh, economic opportunities and uh, there are a lot of uh, mutuality. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we also have, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are also part of uh, uh, similar uh, initiatives uh, or ideas uh, uh, mooted by other countries, for example, uh, uh, with Japan. Uh, uh, their uh, initiative of uh, Big B. Uh, we are part of that, uh, centering around uh, development of a deep sea port in our uh, southern part uh, with a lot of possibilities. Uh, uh, and uh, within our region, uh, with uh, uh, India, Nepal, and Bhutan, uh, we have this uh, <coughs> BBIN uh, initiative. Uh, then uh, with uh, BIMSTEC, another regional uh, body, we have some. Uh, initiatives uh, with the uh, uh, Asian Development Bank and SASEP. Uh, there are uh, regional uh, initiatives on uh, connectivity, uh, not just uh, uh, road connectivity, but also uh, connecting energy grids. Uh, therefore, uh, we are open uh, to ideas of these kind of uh, collaborations, but uh, there have to be, uh, you know, a win-win kind of proposition uh, for all the countries uh, involved. Uh, as far as uh, uh, our uh, cooperation with China is concerned, uh, we always uh, carefully uh, weigh uh, the economic uh, benefits and also the risk, uh, uh, you know, exposure uh, element. Uh, therefore, uh, we think that uh, so far we are managing well and uh, other countries uh, may learn uh, not to overdo things and uh, see uh, how uh, the benefits uh, are uh, being uh, planned or, uh, you know, uh, programmed so that uh, if you get uh, over uh, burdened or, uh, you know, overexposed, uh, then uh, it might entail uh, other risks uh, down the line. So, uh, so far we are okay. I mean, in terms of our, uh, you know, uh, interest uh, burden or our uh, credit uh, burden, uh, I think we, we can manage uh, with uh, our own uh, resources. Uh, on uh, uh, Myanmar issue, uh, of course, with Myanmar, we don't have any other problem. We, we had one uh, issue of maritime uh, delimitation of uh, uh, our uh, water or 
but then uh, that was uh, resolved uh, through uh, international uh, means, uh, I mean, settlement means. Uh, but uh, when uh, these uh, 1.1 million uh, uh, Rohingyas uh, were forcibly displaced from uh, Myanmar uh, last uh, about four years ago, or more than four years ago, then uh, of course uh, it became uh, a, a serious problem for us. And the Honorable Prime Minister was uh, generous enough to uh, welcome these people in Bangladesh. Uh, but ever since their arrival, uh, one side is, of course, the humanitarian assistance or continuation of the humanitarian assistance, which we are managing uh, with the help of the international community and the UN. But from the very beginning, uh, we have been uh, saying uh, that uh, it needs to be uh, resolved uh, politically as well. And the only uh, you know, uh, solution uh, uh, that uh, we think is uh, there is the uh, you know, voluntary repatriation of these people uh, back to Myanmar, where they came from, uh, in, uh, in peace, in security, in sustainability, in safety. Uh, we have been talking to the Myanmar authorities for the last, uh, till February, uh, till end of January, uh, under different uh, mechanisms. And we uh, actually uh, made an arrangement uh, for uh, a bilateral arrangement uh, for these people to return uh, to uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the Myanmar authorities uh, uh, before uh, February, uh, they uh, agreed uh, on a lot of issues, but uh, when it came to uh, delivery or implementation, uh, we always uh, found, uh, you know, uh, they were not uh, fully there. Uh, given that context, when China offered their help uh, through a trilateral arrangement, uh, so we welcomed that, and then uh, we held a number of uh, con rounds of consultation with China uh, to pursue a trilateral arrangement. And basically, uh, since uh, China uh, has been uh, supportive of the Myanmar, uh, you know, authorities. Uh, and also in the Security Council, uh, they were pushing for bilateral solution and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> also they had uh, their own uh, involvement there. Uh, we thought uh, if China is there, then uh, Myanmar would deliver uh, on the arrangements that we have agreed bilaterally. So on that basis, uh, we uh, moved along. But unfortunately, after uh, 1st of February, things uh, again, uh, went downhill and uh, although uh, we remained uh, open uh, as far as the uh, repatriation uh, uh, engagements are concerned uh, to carry out uh, discussions but we have not heard from them we have also been uh, telling the chinese that uh, to use their influence uh, whatever they have uh, with the present uh, dispensation uh, but we have not also uh, heard any uh, concrete uh steps uh, from them uh kind of, so we have uh, reached a kind of an impasse uh and in this backdrop uh, we are somewhat encouraged uh, when uh, asean uh, got involved after the february uh, uh, coup d'etat and uh, they have recently announced a special envoy and we have already reached out uh, and hopefully uh, when, during his uh, engagements uh, with the myanmar uh, authorities now uh, this uh, agenda of repatriation would also be there along with his other agenda. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, meanwhile, uh, the, uh, these people are languishing and uh, uh, this situation is becoming uh, more and more protracted, uh, which will, of course, have its own risks. And uh, Bangladesh is trying to mitigate such risks. And uh, we have arranged also a temporary relocation of about 100,000 of them in an island, uh, which is fully developed now. Uh, but these are all temporary solutions. Uh, you know, the only solution we think, uh, if you leave out uh, possible integration or third country resettlement, is repatriation. Uh, so we should never uh, lose uh, focus uh, on that. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, the world is continuously facing uh, new challenges and new uh, crises or hotspots are emerging. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, we would like the international community to keep this in their mind and, and continuously push uh, Myanmar uh, to resolve it as early as possible.
Thank you. Before I come to, uh, to my two colleagues here, I have another question uh, uh, on line, which I'll just sort of read quickly. Uh, it's from Farida Khan, uh, who's a British Bangladeshi. And she said, uh, she asked, I would like to ask what measures you have in place to restore any lost local public confidence in the manufacturing sector, including garment factories that have helped give many women opportunities for greater autonomy. What measures are you taking to help bridge trade relationships between large Western retailers and their contracts with local Bangladeshi trade to ensure Bangladeshi women continue to play a pivotal role in the social and economic development of a new 21st century Bangladesh? One second. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a kind of a uh, challenge that uh, we have to uh, face uh, more uh, so in the coming uh, months and years uh, when uh, uh, Bangladesh actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, gets uh, uh, its graduation and all the concessions are taken out. Uh, we have been assured by the EU and also the UK uh, today that uh, uh, this uh, GSP uh, facilities will, uh, or similar facilities will continue till uh, 2029. Uh, so we have about uh, eight years uh, for this uh, transition. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we had some temporary uh, uh, setbacks uh, due to COVID uh, last year. Our factories uh, remained uh, closed uh, for some time. Uh, and uh, the government was uh, very much uh, aware and sensitive uh, about uh, the uh, workers' uh, overwhelming numbers, of course, uh, women. And with the help of uh, uh, digital uh, methods, uh, through uh, you know tele uh, banking, uh, we uh, the prime minister uh, announced uh, several uh, kinds of uh, uh, incentives and supports. So uh, money actually uh, reached directly uh, you know, to these uh, 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 women workers. And uh, when uh, uh, the factories uh, were reopened, uh, we uh, the government and other authorities were con continuously in touch. Uh, with the uh, owners of these factories so that uh, safety measures would be uh, ready. And, and uh, I think a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, the prime minister ordered that uh, all these uh, uh, workers and their families uh, and, and people in the neighborhood should be fully uh, vaccinated. Uh, therefore, uh, we are uh, trying to take care of their uh, immediate or short-term uh, needs and, and challenges. Uh, but the main problem that uh, we envisage is uh, if the, the buyers and, and the importers in, in the developed uh, countries and markets, if they are not ready uh, to also uh, share uh, some of these uh, uh, burdens or responsibilities, whatever you call it, because we are now uh, going uh, in, a, in a, a big way for full compliance uh, of factories and other uh, facilities, uh, you know, uh, giving them uh, better uh, conditions, uh, work conditions and emoluments. Uh, obviously, uh, if the consumers in the developed countries uh, do not bear a part of that uh, extra cost, then uh, it would be very difficult for uh, our uh, uh, producers or, or exporters to maintain the same level of uh, safety and compliance which is uh, desirable, uh, you know, not only by us, but also uh, by our uh, partners in the West. So this is a challenge and then, uh, you know, uh, with the help, understanding and cooperation uh, from uh, the uh, importers, as well as the consumers in the West, if they continue to uh, buy or want to buy, you know, a three pound or $3 t-shirts or $5 uh, shirts, uh, then uh, it would be very difficult uh, for us to maintain the same uh, or a higher level of uh, facilities to our workers. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Let me take uh, sort of three or four questions here in this room before I go back uh, online. And let me start going from left to right, uh, William Crawley. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really uh, focusing on elements of these uh, very positive elements of the building blocks of Bangladesh's foreign policy, positive elements which may be not in contradiction, but nevertheless, nevertheless in competition. And one of those, um, you talked about the importance of non-alignment, and you talked about the importance of multilateralism. In India's case, with the Modi's government, people have 
uh, observers or commentators uh, are saying non-alignment has become less important to India and has really been taken over by multilateralism. Would you say that has been the case, or that is the case with Bangladesh as well? Before you answer, let me come to my colleague Antoine Levesque. Like... Foreign Secretary, um, following up on your remarks about um, China, I have two supplementary questions. One, um, back in June, the group of seven uh, countries um, um, revealed or unveiled an initiative, uh, which I think the United States has dubbed the Build Back Better World Partnership. I wonder if um, there is something in there for, uh, for Bangladesh. Would you agree with that? That is the first question. The second question relates to um, China and South Asia during the pandemic. It has um, been the case that Bangladesh has joined uh, other South Asian countries minus India, uh, but including China in meetings related to uh, solving the COVID-19 uh, challenges. Um, do you, um, are you confident that uh, Bangladesh can uh, balance out um, the occurrence of those meetings uh, in a satisfactory way with India and uh, address India's concerns um, in that regard. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, I mean, uh, G7 is obviously uh, very important uh, for not only us, but the whole world. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the world uh, has been observing uh, the various uh, declarations and, and commitments that came out of the G7 meetings. Uh, we in Bangladesh are also believe uh, to uh, you know build back better, whether it is the medical uh, you know uh, healthcare system or education uh, or uh, what have you. Uh, therefore, uh, if there is uh, uh, some uh, some indication of uh, of uh, cooperation or some indication of partnership coming out of that. Uh, pronouncements, uh, we would be very happy uh, to join that. Uh, regarding your uh, second question, yes, uh, you are absolutely right that uh, we have uh, uh, taken part in, in some of these uh, meetings. I myself attended, uh, I think, a couple of these meetings and uh, uh, we uh, viewed them as, uh, uh, you know, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, you know, emergency period when uh, we were desperately looking for uh, vaccines uh, to vaccinate our huge uh, population. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, we welcomed any overture of uh, help or assistance, uh, especially in this particular field. And uh, we felt that uh, China had the capability. Uh, and in fact, we bought uh, significant numbers of Sinopharm uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, we approached many other countries, but uh, uh, you know, uh, the reality is uh, uh, we found that the Chinese uh, companies uh, had the capability to churn out uh, uh, millions of uh, doses in a in, uh, you know, short period of time. Uh, and uh, we, we liked what they said at that time, that they will uh, come up with a regional hub uh, where uh, they will have a kind of standby uh, you know, uh, stock uh, or supplies of not only vaccines, but also, uh, mm, uh, you know, medical equipments, emergency medical equipments, and also oxy oxygen concentrators and other uh, things which were required uh, during the emergency period. Uh, we uh, don't uh, see this uh, as a kind of a, a political grouping, uh, as far as purely uh, humanitarian or, or uh, you know, healthcare related uh, initiative. So that's why we, we became a part of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we ourselves have been helping out uh, other countries in the region. We have sent, uh, you know, materials to Bhutan, to Nepal, to Sri Lanka. We have sent our nurses and our supplies to Maldives uh, to vaccinate their population. And also, uh, so therefore, uh, you know, Indonesia also, we sent uh, medicines uh, as our pharmaceutical uh, uh, sector is quite robust. Uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, very crucial medicines uh, uh, were uh, uh, demanded uh, in those countries and, and we readily uh, complied. Uh, therefore, uh, we believe that uh, COVID has uh, taught us 
that uh, you know we should all help each other and not uh, because uh, unless uh, everybody is better uh, no one is uh, safe or uh, in a, in a good position uh, therefore uh, uh, we we were quite open in those days and even now uh, you know uh, wherever we we get uh, the other day we got uh, 200000 plus uh, vaccines uh, astrazeneca from uh, from bulgaria <laughs> quite an unlikely source but uh, you know uh, we readily accepted that and uh, we believe uh, uh, some other uh, countries uh, who are sitting on huge uh, stockpiles of uh, vaccines and they're not even sure that whether they would use them uh, you know, through a third dose or otherwise. Uh, and vaccines are also time bound or, or dated. Uh, therefore, uh, we, we uh, urge uh, all such countries uh, two things. One is to uh, treat vaccines and public goods and number two also to uh, transfer the technology uh, to countries who are capable to produce them like Bangladesh and then uh, we can serve the humanity much better. Yeah, I don't see any uh, any contradiction between non-alignment and multilateralism. I think uh, uh, if I understood the question right, I don't want to comment what uh, India wants to do. Uh, but our commitment to uh, non-alignment is uh, is very much uh, uh, you know enshrined in our constitution, and our father of the nation was also very clear on that. And this uh, dictum, uh, friendship to all and malice to, towards none, uh, is uh, also based on that. Uh, and that's why in the United Nations uh, over the years, uh, uh, since our uh, first. Uh, uh, you know, admission, uh, I mean, our admission in 1974, when the father of the nation uh, went to the UN and uh, made his uh, speech in Bangla, uh, it, it was quite clear uh, that, uh, I mean, he set the center stage for our uh, subsequent uh, uh, engagement in the UN. Uh, we are a champion of uh, multilateralism, and we feel that uh, countries like Bangladesh uh, have everything to gain uh, from uh, multilateralism, uh, and we still uh, do all sorts of activities uh, in the UN. And this year, uh, hopefully, um, uh, you know, the Honorable Prime Minister uh, will uh, physically go to New York and uh, attend uh, as many events as possible. And events uh, or subjects or areas or themes uh, which are of global nature, it's not just uh, Bangladesh. So as we uh, are in the crossroads of the 50 years of our independence, uh, we believe that with our experience of last 50 years, we can uh, contribute we are in a much better position now to contribute uh, in, in the future uh, to help uh, other countries uh, in similar situations uh, through South-South uh, uh, cooperation, triangular cooperation. And, and we have gained a lot of experience in, uh, in uh, public service delivery. Uh, which we think uh, we can uh, you know, uh, give it to other countries uh, who are uh, not in the same position. Uh, therefore, only through multilateral mechanisms, uh, these are uh, possible to uh, you know, uh, implement. Uh, Foreign Secretary, we've, uh, we, we've sort of crossed the hour, but I'm going to extend the session by a few more minutes because we started late. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Viraj, uh, and my colleague in the Murad to ask their questions. And if there's time after your response, I have one or two more, two more questions on my phone, which I will ask uh, from people attending this. But let me uh, turn now to my colleague, Viraj Solanki. Thank you, uh, Foreign Secretary. Viraj Solanki from the IISS. My question is um, on Indian Ocean security and multilateralism. Bangladesh will soon become a full member of the uh, so-called Colombo security conclave, along with uh, India, Sri Lanka, Mauritius, um, Seychelles, and the Maldives. At the same time, <clears throat> Bangladesh um, is an active member of BIMSTEC with the Secretariat in Dhaka, which has a focus on maritime security, <clears throat> and is a part of uh, Indian Ocean regional security groupings. How do you think these groupings can best coordinate to ensure uh, convergences so that Bangladesh's priorities are met in terms of Indian Ocean security in these groupings? Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Um, 
um, Foreign Secretary. I, you mentioned multilateralism, obviously, and the key emphasis on the Bangladesh government's chairmanship of the uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum. I'm just wondering what can we expect from the leadership from Bangladesh on this front, particularly with COP here in Glasgow? And um, do you have, for example, an understanding with the British government who are hosting? Clearly, that would be critical to them, given that uh, Bangladesh chairs um, the CF, uh, CVF with 48 members. Uh, and what can we expect in the future? And a final element to the question, you've seen quite a lot of interest about what China's doing in Bangladesh. Can you tell us what China's doing on climate change with Bangladesh, if anything at all? Because um, they are a major player on that front and they do like to think of themselves as, uh, as part of the developing world. Mm. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, we are, uh, you know, at the Bay of Bengal and uh, uh, we uh, believe that uh, by uh, cooperating uh, in the Bay of Bengal and then the Indo-Pacific, uh, we are also uh, part of that. Uh, therefore, uh, we need a stable, a safe, uh, you know, uh, situation in, in that whole area. And the countries in the region, uh, they all have, uh, you know, serious stake, uh, you know, if they want to uh, prosper uh, jointly, uh, we have to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, there is a, a full uh, accessibility of navigation. Uh, we have to uh, ensure, uh, you know, uh, uh, fishing uh, uh, or other uh, resources are, uh, you know, fully uh, utilized, uh, maintaining uh, the rule of law and uh, and not, uh, you know, uh, over overfishing or uh, exhausting our resources. Uh, we have a strong policy of uh, uh, blue economy initiatives and, and that uh, uh, we will pursue uh, uh, along with our other, uh, you know, interested uh, partners. Uh, you are quite up to date, uh, it seems. Uh, uh, regarding our, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, first initially joined as observer for this Colombo thing and then uh, see how it is uh, beneficial for us. Uh, we are also uh, becoming chairman of the Indian Ocean uh, Rim Association, IORA, uh, from this November. Uh, so as chairman, we also have the responsibility to see or sit with all other uh, littoral uh, countries in the region. Uh, so that uh, we uh, pursue a win-win uh, situation uh, uh, in, in, in the exploration or in the utilization of our uh, sea uh, resources. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, uh, increasing interest are being shown uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific and uh, we would like to see ourselves uh, also as a, as a major uh, player but we'll be a little hesitant or uh, we'll be a little bit careful if these uh, uh, initiatives uh, have any uh, security or defense overtones or, or uh, you know, uh, biases, uh, then uh, we have to, uh, you know, uh, match that with other, our other priorities. Uh, uh, but if it, it is uh, kind of a mutually uh, uh, beneficial or it is good for the region uh, or economic uh, for the economic prosperity of the region will be very much uh, interested to pursue uh, these uh, initiatives uh, the question on oh okay yes uh, <laughs> uh, cvf uh, chairmanship uh, is very important at this uh, crucial juncture uh, for us because we are having this uh, uh, you know, uh, COP26 uh, uh, November, hardly any time. Uh, and uh, we have been uh, uh, discussing amongst the members of uh, CVF uh, how to uh, represent them better. Uh, obviously, uh, the vulnerabilities, all are vulnerable, these 48 countries, but they are of different magnitude, uh, different, uh, you know, dimensions. Uh, for example, Bangladesh uh, has very severe uh, risk factors uh, uh, if for if, if uh, global uh, warming uh, uh, which is happening and uh, consequential uh, sea level rise and we have many uh, small uh, island states also in that state uh, same uh, situation uh, 
but uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh is uh, much bigger uh, economy-wise, but some of these other countries are much smaller, so their vulnerability is at another level. Uh, we also have these uh, issue of uh, climate refugees or uh, internally uh, displaced people, whatever you call them. Uh, so there are uh, many issues which uh, bind us together and we'll try to see, uh, you know, what are the uh, most, uh, you know, uh, common elements of these vulnerabilities, which we would like to, uh, uh, you know, um, raise uh, at the bigger forum. And uh, already we have been talking with the UK, uh, Mr. Alok Sharma, the special envoy, uh, and also uh, uh, is the president designate, and also Mr. John Kerry, who is the special envoy of the US president. He came to Bangladesh. Uh, we are, uh, we will uh, organize uh, a joint event, uh, hopefully with the UK uh, in Glasgow uh, to uh, raise the profile. Uh, what we want, uh, of course, we want uh, uh, the promises to be kept and uh, implemented, especially these uh, uh, hundred billion dollar and also enhancement and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, another point is, uh, uh, in the recent times, you have seen more emphasis on mitigation, uh, but uh, we believe that adaptation is also equally important for many of the uh, countries because many of these vulnerable countries, they were not responsible for, uh, you know, climate change. They are not uh, responsible for uh, global warming, but they are bearing the brunt of, of the, you know, uh, uh, of the situation of, of the actions of uh, other countries. Uh, therefore, uh, we'll also uh, try to highlight the loss and damage aspect of it and how uh, these countries uh, could be compensated. So keep that discussion uh, open or ongoing uh, and also have some kind of balance between our adaptation uh, uh, efforts and uh, mitigation efforts because, you know, uh, we don't have much to mitigate uh, other than, uh, you know, uh, com uh, committing ourselves and uh, following through. Uh, the uh, you know 1.5 degree uh, uh, commitment, but on adaptation area, I think we have a lot to do, and Bangladesh has has uh, gained a lot of experience also in this. A lot of best practices we have developed, which we can also share with uh, countries uh, in the same group. Uh, uh, how far China is uh, maintaining their uh, climate change related okay. commitment to Bangladesh? Uh, I'm not sure uh, because they have. Uh, uh, also a lot to do in your the mainland China then, uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure in all the projects that are being undertaken in Bangladesh, so there are always uh, climate change uh, components there and which are fully uh, complied with. So uh, our authorities uh, will make sure that these uh, projects uh, remain uh, in a climate uh, change compliant or, or uh, in a full uh, resiliency is there. Uh, so uh, we will make sure uh, that uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, does not have uh, investments from not only from China for any other country uh, for their uh, sunset industries, uh, which uh, might uh, compromise our own, uh, you know, environmental uh, situation uh, any further. Uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, I'll only be able to take one of the three questions on my phone, but I think it's important, and it basically goes like this: that. There was recently a controversy in Bangladesh. Uh, you've talked with Indo-Pacific and uh, there was a real controversy over uh, a sense that uh, Bangladesh was keen to join the Quad. Uh, the Chinese ambassador, I think, had a response. Your foreign minister had a counter response. Could you shed some light on actually what happened factually? I mean, remember this session is on record, but I think there've been various interpretations and possibly misinterpretations from that particular event. So if you're able to clarify uh, it, it would be very helpful for all of us. Thank you. Uh, of course, we did not receive any formal inv invitation to join Quad. So joining Quad or not joining Quad is not an issue at this point of time. And I already have said that uh, if uh, Quad has any uh, security centric uh, uh, overtures or, or motives behind it, then uh, we'll always be careful. Uh, but having said that, uh, whatever the Chinese uh, ambassador said uh, in, in his interaction with the press, uh, it also came to our notice. And uh, later on, uh, our uh, Honorable Foreign Minister cleared it, saying that uh, <clears throat> uh, it is the sovereign decision of Bangladesh, and depending on our priorities, 
uh, we will, uh, you know, uh, join or get involved in any initiative. So uh, for a third country, uh, you know, uh, there's no scope for advising us. Uh, when we talked to the Chinese ambassador, I myself talked to him and uh, he assured me that uh, uh, because of uh, the English language uh, conduct of that particular meeting, maybe his uh, uh, words didn't come out as he uh, meant. So that was his explanation. So basically uh, he retracted uh, from this, uh, you know, assertion that was, uh, that was reported in the press. Excellent. Thank you very much, Foreign Secretary, for that clarification. And with that, uh, we have to end uh, this session. But before we do, I'd like to thank the Foreign Secretary for the time he spent at the IIWS physically in person uh, to talk about Bangladesh, Bangladesh's top uh, foreign policy priorities and also respond extensively to a series of questions that were put to him both within the Institute, in this room and online. So thank you very much, sir, for coming here. And we look forward to continuing our work uh, related to Bangladesh uh, with the support of the High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the United Kingdom. Thank you and goodbye.